this page, welcome. If you're not subscribed, subscribe so that you can get notifications whenever I put up videos. Um, today's video is actually a continuation of a video that I just put up prior to this one. So if you haven't seen the video before this one, you should absolutely check it out because this is kind of part two on how to apply to the US, but it's not really a how to. This is more so a video about what you should consider before you start this application process. So yeah, without further ado, I just wanna give you five main things that I think everybody should consider before starting this process because it is very tedious, it is very expensive, very, very expensive, and it requires a lot of effort and a lot of time. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's important you consider these factors before you actually start the application process. All right, let's get into it. Hey guys, okay, so five things you need to know before applying for medical residencies in the US. Uh, first things first, I'm just gonna tell you this, that what I highlighted before is the process to applying and the things that should afford you a position at the end of the journey. But you know, as much as we say trust the process, there is no assurance in this process that you will match. You could pass your exams, you could do well, and there's a possibility you still may not match. I have seen it in Facebook forums where people have stellar grades and they have not matched, and vice versa. I've seen people who seem to be, you know, like unlikely to match and they have matched. So just take it with a grain of salt. And I say it's one of these things where you go in there, you give your best shot, and what will be will be. So you know, don't go in there cocky thinking I've gotten 260, 260, absolutely got this down. And don't go in there thinking, oh man, I've only got like a 213 on my step exam. I might not make it. You, you've got to make sure where you mess up on your application, you try to kind of compensate elsewhere because there's always an opportunity to make it through. You know, if you're somebody that wants this to be a fail safe application cycle, I would say this is the wrong application to be looking at. Uh, because there is no guarantee that you will match. I mean, God forbid that will not be any one of our, our stories, but I'm just saying this is something you need to take into consideration. So this said, let's talk about data and statistics. This data is taken from the NRMP website, and uh, this is www.nrmp.org. This is the National Resident Matching Program. They collect statistics after each and every match. So when once residents secure jobs, they start to take like demographic information. As we can see, 11 to 12,000, I would, I would say like roughly 12,000 um, IMGs and FMGs matched into the 2020 residency cycle. That is looking at the pie chart, that's looking like almost a third of the total class that entered were trained abroad. We look at match rates of international medical graduates now in terms of specialties. So specialties also vary. Some specialties are a lot more competitive than others, and some specialties you are a lot more likely to match as an IMG than, than others. For example, we look at vascular surgery. Non-US IMGs, only 17% matched into the specialty, which was their preferred specialty. And then we look at something like neurology, or yeah, let's take neurology with 68% matching, non-US MGs, IMGs matching into that. And that's a big difference, you know? You're going from having a two-thirds shot of matching into your preferred specialty to having like less than a one in five chance. Definitely, definitely it's important to kind of gauge where you're at. For example, if you want to go into vascular surgery, you know you got to go in there gun-ho. Your application has got to be the best that it can be so that you have the best shot at actually matching. So that said, I want to mention the top five non-US IMG programs based on the statistics is PEDS, Neuropathology, Radiation Oncology, and Radiology. The top four for US IMGs, so that's greater than 60% matching into their preferred specialty, is PEDS, MedPEDS, which is internal medicine and pediatrics combined, and radiology. So those are programs where if you are an IMG, you can go into, not confidently, but feeling a little bit like, okay, I have a good shot at possibly matching. 
ones that have lower preferred match rates, I have mentioned already vascular surgery and also orthopedic surgery, I would mention. So for those ones, you would have to then think, okay, I also need to diversify and maybe have a second specialty that I'm applying to just in case I don't get my first um, um, specialty, which is why I was saying it is important to also be honest with yourself in this process because uh, sometimes if you if you're gun ho on for example being a vascular surgeon there's a real probability that you will not match into uh, vascular surgery would you be okay with going to your second program maybe your second program is dermatology if you know in your heart of hearts you want to be a vascular surgeon and you don't want to be a dermatologist you've got to really kind of gauge if this application is worthwhile in that sense so specifically i want to also talk about programs that are maybe not necessarily considered img friendly as i was mentioning now but are seeing increases over the years so there are some programs though they may have low numbers they're growing in how many img applicants they're taking which means maybe imgs are making a good you know uh, impression and so program directors are like well we want more imgs in our next class so we see emergency medicine is increasing uh, in uh, medicine primary care is also increasing um, neurology also is increasing we saw neurology before already so that's a good one because not only is it that people are matching highly into neurology but it's also continuing to increase in the number of IMGs it's taking. One thing I want to point out is internal medicine, the categorical. So the difference between preliminary and categorical is preliminary is only a first year um, kind of residency, whereas categorical is it's your entire internal medicine training. You don't have to reapply again after a year. So anyways, uh, internal medicine categorical, we see here almost 50% of that class that entered in 2020 was IMGs. That goes to show you that internal medicine likes foreign medical graduates. And for me, I like internal medicine. And when I see this, I'm thinking, oh, this is great because I'm going to apply to as many internal medicine programs as possible. I may not even have a second choice program that I rank because I mean, my odds are pretty high in internal medicine. Um, I think the only other thing that I would be interested in is actually neurology. So I would maybe go for neurology. But yeah, essentially, you see based on statistics where you kind of are at in terms of your odds. And we see again pathology pediatrics, which we mentioned earlier, they're increasing in the number of internal, I mean, not internal medicine, the number of interns they're taking. Same goes for radiology and surprisingly surgery, which is again what I was saying. You know, you, you see surgery and you think, oh, it's competitive, I need a second choice. But here, this is encouraging data that you should also see that sur surgery programs are starting to take more IMGs. So even though it might seem difficult, maybe it's worthwhile for you to apply to surgery programs because they are starting to take more IMGs. Uh, and that was the surgery categorical I'm talking about. So then we move on to costs. So costs, it's, it's an expensive cost. I'm even missing a cost here. My apologies for that. I'll get to that. So first things first, when you apply for your ECFMG certificate, um, you have to pay $100, $150 fee. Um, you have to pay $975 both for the step one and step two CK exams. Additionally, you will have to pay surcharges if you're taking these exams abroad. It's $180 for step one and $200 for step two CK, then you have to take OET, the English exam, uh, which was put in place for the step two clinical skills exam, which got canceled. So that's an extra 455 US. And then additionally, you have to send your USMLE transcript uh, once you have passed these exams to ERAS, and I'll come and talk about ERAS soon. And that's a another $80. But the thing that I'm missing here is your actual ECFMG certificate. So now because step two clinical skills is canceled, the ECFMG is charging another 900 um, in order to get the certificate done. So you might as well put a thousand to that 3,500 I've got at the bottom screen as the subtotal and say 4,500 is your subtotal. So then you need an ERAS token. ERAS token is 145 
what does the ERAS token allow you to do? It allows you to start your actual application. So uploading your documents, like your letters of recommendation, your personal statement, um, your dean's letter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then you actually have to apply for the actual schools. So this is how ERAS breaks down these fees. So let's say I am pretty happy with internal medicine and I'm only going to apply for internal medicine. I'm going to pay a flat fee of 99 for 10 programs. If I want to, to apply to more than 10 programs, then I would have to pay $16 for each additional program until I get to 20 programs. If I want to apply to 30, I would have to pay then $20 for each additional program between 21 to 30. In my last 10 basically programs I'm going to apply, I need to now pay 20 each instead of 16 each. So that's how they work out how much you're going to pay. But let's say I want to apply for vascular surgery and I know I need to have a backup plan and I decide I'm going to also apply to, uh, I don't know, um, general surgery. So I have to pay 99 for for vascular surgery plus 99 for um, general surgery. And then if I'm applying for lots of programs in these individual ones, I would additionally pay um, more fees. So the other thing that we have to pay once we do these applications, you file your applications, you go through interviews, you're offered an interview, and maybe you're offered seven interviews and you decide you're only gonna rank the seven places where you actually interview. So if that's the case, you only pay an $85 fee to the NNRMP. Sorry, I did not mention what ERAS stands for. I have mentioned it in my other video, but just to clarify to you guys, um, ERAS actually stands for the Electronic Residency Application Service. And this is to be differentiated from NRMP, which is the National Residence Match Program. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure on that. National Resident Match Program. I'm pretty sure that's what it stands for. Yeah, matching program, not match program, matching program. So if I'm only ranking my seven programs, I'm paying a fee of uh, 85. However, if I want to rank more programs, then I have to pay $30 for all the extra programs I rank beyond 20. And if I'm ranking 100 to 150 or above that, I'm paying an additional fee. And if I want to match with my husband or my wife or my significant other or girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, you have to pay an additional 45 fee if you guys want to be considered as a couple match at a hospital. So then you, after you filed this ERAS, I mean this NRMP match registration, you actually have your match and yeah, that's it. So the subtotal is really 4,500. And I say this is subtotal because you still have other costs like your examination study fees, one question bank, online question bank could run you from 200 to $700 uh, US and it depends on how long you're going to use the question bank and this is just for maybe one exams question bank and then other books as well but you this is where you can kind of have a bit of wiggle room with how much extra you will spend because if you're smart street smart you will find ways to cost cut u.s clinical experience i talked about it in my previous video so please go back to that but again observ observership will be cheaper than a clinical rotation but a clinical rotation will get you a better letter so you just got to be wise with your stuff interview expenses i don't know if they're going to be in person this year but last year they were virtual so people save costs with not having to fly to hospitals to actually interview and then finally you have like visa fees and moving costs because you need to budget um yeah your first month there so your deposit and your actual living costs so this is an overview of the timeline I just want to give you guys before I run out of time. As you guys can see, it's roughly a two to three year process. So you really need to be able to commit this amount of time to apply to the US. So you see, it's a very lengthy process. So last but absolutely not least, you need, need to go in with the right motivations because this process is very very difficult and you need to be motivated to get through this entire process so before starting think about why you want to do this and what's going to be the driving thing that keeps you going all right guys so i hope this video was useful and i hope it will help guide you in your final decision on whether or not to apply to the u.s 
if you have any questions feel free to leave them in the comment section um, again I just want to say that the comment sections are useful for discussions especially you know sometimes I might not have an answer to something you might ask but somebody watching this might have the answer so feel free to leave a comment there and don't feel like oh maybe I'm asking too much if I can help I will answer it if I can't then yeah I'll, I'll be honest and say I don't really know how to answer this or redirect you maybe in the right direction if I can anyways have a good one guys I will see you for the next video